Good evening. Welcome to 18th Century Handwoven Household Textiles, a LCPL program with Melissa Weaver Dunning. My name is Jeremy Worley, and I work in the program department of Loudoun County Public Library, and I'll be your host for this program. Please feel free to share your comments and questions with me by tap, typing them in the chat box, and I can then relay them to Melissa at the end of our presentation. It is my pleasure to introduce Maliva, Melissa Weaver Dunning. She is a traditional hand weaver and spinner with 40 years of experience working on antique equipment to produce 18th and 19th century style textiles. Melissa began her traditional textile study with Scottish master weaver Norman Kennedy and carries on this rich tradition in her own teaching. Melissa is an avid tartan and linen weaver and a lover of wool who loves sharing her passion for weaving and spinning with students. Welcome, Melissa. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be back doing another program for the library. Um, this particular program, 18th Century American Household Textiles, focuses primarily on three private collections, although maybe I should say four because my collection has grown in the last couple of years, so we'll see some of my pieces as well. Um, and I've broken it up into the type of textiles and the first slide on this um, page, I, I um, reorganized this program to present to the uh, Mid-Atlantic Fiber Association last summer. And I wanted to include um, a, a textile data form. So these are the collections that we're gonna be looking at. Roddy Moore in Virginia, William Leinbach in Pennsylvania, Norman Kennedy in Vermont, and Melissa Weaver Dunning in Virginia, or actually West Virginia now. And I just want to point out that I've tried to orient all of the slides so that the warp threads are vertical. So for those of you who are weavers, that may um, help you understand what you're looking at in some cases. It's uh, I find it helpful. So I put together this um, textile data collection sheet just to organize the information about some of my own pieces, but I also made this available to um, people who have come to this lecture, uh, just a blank form, in case you have items of your own or you're involved with a local um, uh, history uh, society, uh, historical society, and you may have textiles that you want to try to identify or um, to uh, document more information. So in this case, looking at a piece of Venetian carpeting, we'll see this carpeting in a later slide. The date range for this textile is between 1870 and 1920. Um, I base that on the, the era when Venetian carpeting was particularly popular and the fact that there are aniline dyes in this piece, which puts it, 1870 is a pretty good starting date in that case, and um, and also the condition of the piece, and it's unlikely that it was made later than 1920. Um, there is a cotton or twine weft that is a filler, and the wool warp, it's a warp-faced pleave, and I've given the details of the warp has 22 ends per inch, EPI, and the weft has eight picks per inch, PPI. It's 36 and a half inches wide. It's 135 inches long, like a long runner. And um, it's basically was originally an off-white with a colored stripe on each side. And it has no seaming, although there are th loose threads from previous seaming. So this would have been one of many strips of a room-sized carpet that would have been stitched together and unstitched in the spring uh, or on an annual basis to clean it and then brought back into the house and sewn back together because that's the way people did things then. Um, there's some cotton binding sewn over each of the short ends and it's in pretty good condition, but there is some water damage. So anyway, these are the kinds of details that I look at when I'm looking at old pieces. So we're gonna start with blankets. And this is a view of Roddy Moore's cupboard. The first time I met Roddy, I met him through Norman Kennedy and we went to visit him and we arrived later in the day and uh, had supper with uh, Roddy and his wife. And he said, I have something in the other room I think you'd like to see. 
and he took me into his little den and opened up this armoire and it was full of blankets. And it was so exciting to me as a weaver because I began my, my weaving life as a blanket weaver and blankets are one of the things that are less often collected. They're not as sexy as overshot or fancier coverlets. And they also tend to be something that was worn, used until it was worn out um, or became rags. So it was very exciting to see all these blankets. And in this cupboard, he has such a variety. There are cotton blankets, wool blankets, uh, linen blankets. There are checked and plaid pieces and um, there are twill pieces and fancy twill and there are some <clears throat> very and there's some Lindsay Woolsey the striped piece at the top here and then the checkerboard below that kind of a faded blue and red checkerboard is a German two block design sometimes called a rib weave although in this case it's almost more of a balanced weave and has this checkerboard effect. And here is another group of blankets we've got cotton. Um, plain weave wool, twill wool, just all kinds of blankets. And so this is half of that cupboard from top to bottom. And here's another example of this German two block design. You only need two shafts to weave this black and right red checkerboard. It works somewhat like a log cabin weave in that you have one block that alternates red um, one one thread and three threads and when you come to the point where you want to end one block, you put two single threads together and the same with the with the weaving of it. So it's a very simple but interesting design. And so just loads and loads of blankets. And so I did have the opportunity to go back to Roddy's house on another occasion and a document um, probably about two dozen of specific pieces. So this is one of them. This is this German two block blanket. And it has a cotton warp and a wool weft. And you're raising three or four multiple threads together and lowering a single thread. And when that alternates, then the blocks change color. And this is another example of the same two block design, only this one has instead of a white warp, it has um, cotton that has been dyed probably in the same dye pot as the wool, but it took it slightly differently um, because cotton and wool need different chemical environments to dye, um, to dye well or to dye similar colors. So there's a yellow and a purplish warp in this one. And you can see that the, the seams although they're not too bad in some places are pretty far off in others. I'll just say something about seaming, which is that most domestic hand weavers, unless they had had more extensive training, one of their goals was that they, they did not strive to match their patterns at the seams. Part of what they were about was weaving a blanket and getting it on the bed to keep themselves or another family member warm. And the idea that it was a mistake for them not to match their seams is, I think, uh, not accurate. I think it's just that that was not part of what they were striving to do, and it wasn't part of their weaving expertise. So here's this uh, orange, and, orange and blue one, a little close up. This is Norman. He wanted me to take a picture of him with two of Roddy's blankets because he said that he had friends back in Scotland who said that tartan was never woven in North America. And so this was his intent to prove them wrong. So these are two beautiful tartan blankets. The one on the left, a very simple check pattern with a, um, a crosshair of white going through both, both color blocks. And then the other one, a more complicated tartan. And those are both wool, all wool. And this is the one on the left um, with that lovely yellow green sort of pea green color that we see more in British Isles textiles, but also is found uh, particularly um, pieces that were made by people who had recently emigrated. So that particular hue was a popular one. And pretty a pretty good match at the seam. So this is something that you want to document, but um, and it might tell you if something was hand home woven or not domestically woven. 
This is an interesting plain weave piece with the very strong color that that red is quite strong and it's plain weave, but it has what's called tracking. Um, so it looks as though there's a very complex weave structure to this, but it's just over one under one and when the piece is washed the differential shrinkage of the materials will cause this um it looks almost like a, a fancy twill um, and it's just called tracking and it's particularly found with um, singles wool but also sometimes with cotton and other materials and you can see the seam in this one a uh, white thread was used and also whenever you're looking at seams it's not necessarily the first time this piece was seamed because blankets, as I mentioned earlier about carpets, were also taken apart to be um, washed and then put back together again. And we've just got a rolled hem with a simple whip stitch at the edge. And one of the edges of this blanket was fringed. And, and it's hard to say if it was ever hemmed and the hem came out, if it had um, anything to stabilize the fringe because much of the fringe is worn out. This is a red and black um, kind of fancy plaid and it at some point had a black and white calico border, quite wide um, border. And at this point, you can just see where that border was stitched on at the edges. You can see that little bit of black and white and a line of machine stitching, but at some point it was either taken off or it wore out. And this has uh, a seam in which no trouble was made to try and hide the seaming. White thread, um, a, a nice blanket stitch, a very sturdy seam, but definitely quite visible. And here you can see, again, this uh, nice cut curved edge for the seams, but at some point this calico um, must have worn out or been, t been removed, most of it. And some stabilizing was done to the edge in, before that was put on. And this is just a whole stack of blankets. These are, I think, all wool and that lovely fancy twill in the middle. Um, the blue and red and green is quite a nice example. And here's one of them. A nice three color, simple, simple tartan or plaid. And we get in a little closer on the colors. Here's the fancy twill. So it's really just an all over goose eye, but it, it definitely uh, ramps up the design element of the blanket and we can get right in there and see it, which is nice. And this has an overlapped seam. And I forget without consulting my notes, I don't remember if it's machine stitched. Sometimes you'll, you'll definitely see a later seaming. Um, where someone is taking a sewing machine to, to redo the center seam and a rolled edge at the top, the hems at top and bottom. This is, you see a lot of these black or very dark navy blue and white blankets. This one has had a lot of damage over time, but it still is fairly stable. It's probably mostly moth damage, but part of what we were seeing in that last slide is also um, errors on the weaver's part. You see a little triangle here, um, not too far from the seam where the weaver skipped uh, one or two um, threads in weaving. And it's hard to say, I think there's also a little bit of mending in this blanket, but isn't it beautiful? And this is a plain weave with a singles wool warp and weft. And again, it has tracking. So you see sections where it looks like there's a, a more complex pattern, but it's just the shrinkage of those threads. But this is a lovely blanket with a natural sheep's gray and the natural white and then the red. Really beautiful design. No bother with the uh, with the seams. Some some weavers are happy to see seams like this. Hand weavers, just because you feel like, oh, my my selvages don't always look good either. These selvages are a little wonky, and it didn't help with the seaming. This I tossed this one in here. This is a um, blue and red and white uh, goose eye twill blanket that I bought from a vendor at um, a MAFA conference, Mid Atlantic Fiber Association. And my friend Martha Owen pointed it out to me and she says I elbowed her out of the way to get it, but I believe it was a more civil exchange than that. 
Um, but it's a it's a lovely blanket that I'm planning to do some reproduction um, pieces on. But I find this little red block there with the with the corners gone. Uh, interesting. My first thought when I saw that was that a child had been sent to nap and found some loose threads and got bored and picked picked out uh, some of the color at that intersection, all those solid red areas. But it also has a little bit of other damage. Um, there's a piece up at the top where you see a piece of fabric that's been added and the top edge of the blanket nearest our face is an area that wears a great deal. So it's not surprising. It has loose fringe at the corners. It has this lovely intersecting block and um, uh, the goose eye was threaded as a herringbone in part of the border area and resulting in this nice just two by two twill area at the very corner and you can see the fabric that's been added at the top to replace some missing fabric this is a blanket on one of the beds at norman kennedy's house in vermont and you see a lot of these very simple blue and white blankets particularly in new england um, it has a seam down the center oh i didn't describe that so the old blankets would have been woven at, as a half width on the loom. So the first blanket, full size blanket I wove was 45 degrees, uh, 45 inches in the reed. And we wove double the length of our blanket plus extra material for uh, hems and for shrinkage and take up. And so you generally speaking, you plan to weave 40 inches to get a finished yard. So anyway, the, the goal of this blanket was to end up with a 90 by 90 blanket. And you take that long, long strip of cloth and fold it over and sew up one long side seam and, and then cut the top and it opens like a book. So most of these old blankets you find have a center seam and you'll see what we can see of this one is has a beautifully matched, uh, lovely center seam, very well done, but a very simple common blanket. And I suspect that the um, cross stitching hem is not the original, although it's hard to say without examining it farther. Um, it may well have been, but it's this is something, this is thread that tends to get worn out and has to be um, reapplied. And this is yet another blanket. No bother at all with trying to hit that seam. And um, also this weaver did not attempt to center the pattern in a way so that this, the pattern would flow smoothly over the seam area. So you see um, just the way this is structured. And this blanket has an interesting little mark in the corner. And I've asked quite a few people about this, including Norman, and um, no, one, no one has a clear idea whether it was a particular weaver's mark, um, whether it was a laundry mark, you know, to say that this is my blanket, I can identify it by this, this little um, rosette of, of buttonhole stitching in the corner. This is a, a typical blanket found in Scotland but also throughout New England and well into the South. Um, these blankets were originally designed to be used in box beds, where the only part of your bedding that would show to the public if, if people came over to visit your house would be the part of the blanket hanging down the edge of that one side. And so weavers tended to put their pattern where it would be seen and not anywhere else. So it's very typical to find these um, striped blankets. This one has two stripes of slightly different sizes, um, but of five blue stripes in each. And I think we may see some more of these borders, border striped blankets. So this, this blue striped border only appears in the warp. The weft is all white. It's very fast to weave. Um, and it's also just a, a beautiful style of blanket. This weaver also had some little problems. There's some little ladders um, between the striped areas where uh, I think they missed a, a heddle or something, but lovely blanket. And this is, where am I? I have no idea. I've lost my place in my notes. Um, do, do, do. Oh, this is Bill Linebox cupboard. So this is um, one of Bill's collections, one of, part of his collection. And we'll see a great deal more of that. Here is Bill Linebox himself. 
um, and he is holding an interesting and unusual coverlet um, in that it has these white on white areas and then the blue on white areas. Generally speaking, overshot, uh, most overshot that we see is two or more colors, but it has an, an overall design and these white on white stripes are interesting. So this is one of Bill's cover cupboards. He has bought and sold countless textiles mostly around Lebanon, Pennsylvania, where he lives, and many of them he has reproduced in his own weaving. So this is uh, yet another exciting cupboard full of textiles. They're not all blankets. Many of them are coverlets, but there are some blankets in here. So here are quite a few different coverlets. We've got some double weave. We've got some summer and winter. We've got some, I think that's tied beater bond. And um, the stars on the bottom are probably a 20, 22, 24 shaft coverlet. Most of the work that Bill does is more in the style of the professional Pennsylvania German weavers. And so he has more harnesses than I'll ever have, for instance. This is another of his cupboard with beautiful, beautiful old coverlets in it. And we can get in just a little bit closer. So we've got more fancy twills. The very solid blue and white pieces are all double weave. Um, there's some summer and winter in there, which has more of a sort of, mm, sort of the stars to the right, which have sort of a checked appearance within each color area. And here we get in closer to see. So that's one of our summer and winter pieces and a, a mul multiple harness, <clears throat> many harnesses twill up above that. This is a beautiful uh, double weave coverlet with two shades of indigo. So the, for the lighter shade, you would dip your skeins once or twice. For the darkest color, you would dip them more times and leave them in a bit longer. And this is what the back side of that, the reverse side of the double weave looks like. This is another really striking um, dark, 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 dark blue and white double weave. This is a um, summer and winter piece with many, many harnesses. It's hard to, to weave stars without um, at least 12 harnesses. And the more harnesses you have, the more detail you can get in your patterning. This is another fancy, fancy star coverlet. Again, two shades of indigo. This is a very dark, uh, dark navy and white overshot, and it's I want to say it's just fussier. It has really interesting detail, particularly the areas between the larger um, motifs. It just ha has a very different feel to it than most of the overshot that we're likely to see. This is a lot more typical of an all over pattern. Um, and we've got a tree border on this one, which is also nice. And this is just a little scrap. And I'm pretty sure this is the border of something, but honestly, I couldn't tell you. This is an overshot coverlet that I saw in a show at the National Coverlet Museum, which is in Pennsylvania. And I was standing with um, a number of weavers from my Weavers Guild, and someone came in the room and said, oh, look, they sewed it together backwards. And I thought about that, and I said, no. No, they did this on purpose. I, I, think, I don't think you could sew a seam that long the wrong way and not notice before you got to the end of it. And I, my feeling is, and I've had this confirmed by a number of people, that if it was a coverlet that you often used, when you took it apart for cleaning in the spring and put it back together, you might choose to put the borders together just to even out the wear so that your piece will last longer. And so the last time this was washed and sewn back together again, it was sewn with the borders together. And that's just how it ended its um, its life with that family. And after that became an heirloom that was just passed on. This is a very simple, very small figured overshot. And the term overshot refers to the pattern threads, which in this case are kind of a dark gray or a pale green, um, as the threads that go over many, many warp threads in order to create the pattern. This is 
Ah, I'm just trying to remember whose piece this is. Well, I don't remember. Um, this is an interesting piece because it's got uh, indigo dyed cotton warp and tabby weft and then a red patterned wool in the weft. And it has a really, really different feel to it with all that color. And it's very inspiring for modern weavers to think of the many, we have access to so many colors and also so many ways to dye colors and to control color. This piece um, has kind of a funky seam. Parts of it line up. The, you can see the larger picture to the left. You can see part of the seam, but parts of it don't line up at all. And here's another view of that. And another one. Here's a little bit of a pattern called Snail Trail and Cat's Paw. It has quite a no number of other names, but that one's uh, such a charming one, it's easy to remember. This was hanging up in, a, um, in an antique mall in Ohio. And I had not seen it, I think, in this red, white, and blue kind of configuration before. And I, I wanted to remember how the stripes were set up. This is a very simple, probably southern, um, very blocky overshot done in two different, with two different pattern colors. This is one with an uh, off-white or perhaps a pale yellow, but the coloration, and actually, I'm sorry, this one, the warp is, um, is going, is horizontal rather than vertical because the stripes of color are definitely weft. It's hard to say whether this had more color and faded um, if the, whatever dye was used for that sort of pale, pale yellow was something that was quite fugitive and just faded away. Because uh, I would want that to be a little bit stronger in color, but it's still a nice piece. This is an interesting piece I found at an antique mall. I, I don't myself collect coverlets, but I like to take pictures of them because I want to remember things about them. So this one is interesting. It's a, a more blocky, more square kind of pattern. It doesn't have the kind of round chariot wheels that you see in some pieces. Um, and I'm pretty sure this one had three seams, which is a feature often found in southern coverlets. And the pink and the green are also kind of interesting, um, not typical. This, I believe, is a coverlet that's in one of the Shaker Museum collections. And um, it's quite interesting. It has, and I'm pretty sure it's been washed to the point of almost fulling because these solid blue squares, normally you would see a little bit more of the background um, and not get quite so solid an area. So I, I feel like this was washed at some point and started to felt up, fold a little bit. But here are the two primary blocks. And it's just, uh, I haven't seen very many quite like this, so I thought it was very interesting. And this is another view of it, getting to see another section. You can kind of see the sort of checkerboard quality of the big blue blocks, but it's, it's really pretty obscured. But it's a lovely piece, nice strong colors. It's been kept, uh, very well kept although it's lost its bottom hem. This is a very interesting piece that Norman Kennedy had, which he gave to me, so it's now in my possession. Um, there is a similar piece in a book by Oscar Berriot, who was um, a man, a Canadian man who worked very closely with uh, Leclerc Loom Company to create a, a a small portable hand loom, the Dorothy table loom. And uh, Oscar Berrio has a lot of, uh, a lot to do with the revival of hand weaving as a, as a hobby craft in Canada. But the, but the coverlet in his book is, is an overshot with an overlay of a plaid pattern like this. But this structure is not an overshot at all. And I don't have a name for it. Um, Tom Nisley, who taught for many years at the Mannings and now teaches with his daughter Sarah at Redstone Glen, uh, wrote up a draft for it, but I don't have a name for the structure, but it's, a, it's an unusual uh, piece. Norman said he only saw one other piece like this 
and he saw it in the window of an antique store on a Sunday afternoon when the store was closed in Texas, and he was leaving town early the next morning, so he never got to find out more about it. But it's a very curious piece. And this gives you an idea of how fine the threads are, Pre pretty lots of threads per inch. And it has an applied fringe um, on all four sides, which always makes my nose tickle a little bit. It doesn't seem quite right. This is a turned twill, lovely piece in wool, warp, and weft, one of my favorite structures. And this is a southern honeycomb, um, also a piece that was Norman's that he gave to me. And these, these pieces are woven with very fine cotton, and then they're essentially boiled to shrink that cotton to create these deep um, kind of honeycomb cells. And no, we don't get close up. Okay, so if you look at the right-hand side, you can see this little kind of um, grid of cells the center of each of those is plain weave, and when the cloth is shrunk, it ha it bubbles either up or down. It has it has to go somewhere, so you get that that interesting effect. And then the smaller areas between have a tiny, tiny kind of honeycomb. This is a, a blanket that comes from the Acadian culture in what became the maritime provinces of Canada. It's called a couverture de mariage or a marriage coverlet. And um, the French peasant weaving was all done on two harnesses, very, very simple cloth, although they found some very interesting ways of manipulating their weft to create complex patterning. But in this case, this was a rag coverlet, and uh, young girls would start collecting white rags from an early age so that they would have enough cotton or wool rags to, in order to weave for themselves or their mother would weave this uh, white marriage blanket and they're very very plain but they had a great significance in that culture and were preserved and this particular blanket is one that norman kennedy had he's given it to me he bought it from a french canadian woman in vermont in the northeast kingdom of vermont and it has no seam in the center but it's quite wide and when he um, spoke with the woman he bought it from, he said, so this was machine woven. And she said, mais no, no, no. Ma soeur et moi, my sister and I, we wove this after school. We would, um, we would pass the navette, the shuttle, back and forth. And she said, and I am no spring chicken. So this is my couverture de mariage. Okay, now we're going to look at some Venetian carpeting. And it became fashionable with the rise of the middle class, people who had a little more expendable income um, and wanted to have particularly um, a, a nice parlor, wanted to get, have a fancier parlor. They would buy Acadian carpeting or weave for themselves, have woven. Um, and this would be strips of a brightly colored uh, wool-faced, warp-faced rug that would be sewn together to create a room-sized carpet. So here is a very old, very, very yellowed picture, but there's a striped carpet on that floor, and I believe that to be a Venetian carpet. And here is uh, one with almost no color, and you can see the structure of the weave and the stripes. And then I have some other pieces. Sometimes they have these kind of two-shaft checkerboard sections much like that German two block, but then bright colors in between. Sometimes they would have wide ribbons of color, and sometimes these little, um, uh, they would have teeth or this uh, two color section that alternates one color with the other. And this is a warp on Rabbit Goodies um, in her uh, weaving factory up in New York where she's working with vintage power looms. And this is her huge warping reel. And here is a warp for one of her um, Venetian carpetings. And this is another one of Rabbit Goody's um, reproduction carpets. Just beautiful, beautiful colors. They really just shine right, right out of the, the loom. These are a couple of carpets with that two color section, the little sort of railroad section. And 
you can see the colors of the warp um, in the fringe as well. And the weft is a kind of a filler because it's only seen at the edges. This is another one of Rabbit Goody's. Her business is called Thistle Hill Weavers. And this is another one of her reproduction pieces. And this is a yet another one. I think we saw a strip of this earlier. I think that was the original and this is the reproduction. And here is this piece being used in a, on a staircase with this beautiful um, beveled seam, just gorgeous. She's done a lot of work for historic homes throughout um, North America. And here's a piece with a lot of striping in it. Here's a very fancy piece. Some of them were figured weaves, more complex weaves rather than just a plain weave. And here's the sheet again from my Venetian carpeting, but we're not going to go over this, but here's the carpeting. So it has this off white um, and then the, the ribbon of colors and very clearly not plant dyed colors, but um, these would have been aniline dyes. Aniline dyes came about uh, around the time of the Civil War, so that dates this carpeting just a little bit later. And it's a little bit garish, but somebody, somebody I know loved this, having this in their home. And you can see the edges where the threads are that um, at one point sewed this strip to yet another strip. And also the weft is um, a kind of almost like a jute. I'd have to get it under a microscope to know more about what it's made out of. It looks like cotton, looks a little bit like, you know, butcher's twine or string. Okay, now we're going to look at some Lindsay Woolsey. Lindsay Woolsey, by definition, has a linen warp and a singles wool weft. Although once cotton became available in North America, um, commercially, people, uh, weavers switched over to using cotton. They were very happy to be able to buy a fairly inexpensive, strong, good quality cotton. So the historians refer to that as cotton woolsey, but in this case, I'm going to call it all the same. Lindsay woolsey typically has stripes that are woven in. It has a plain warp. Uh, oops, I've got another another slide that has the warp going um, horizontal. Sorry about that, but here I've caught it. So all of these stripes would have been woven in in the weft as they're made. This is a skirt from Bill Leinbach's collection. This would have been a reproduction piece that he created um, with beautiful stripes and that wonderful hem, hem pattern, have a different stripe pattern for the hem. These are two interesting pieces that came from Roddy Moore's collection. Um, the, uh, a later visit, uh, Roddy was showing Norman and I some textiles in a trunk and pulled these two pieces out and we looked at them and said, oh wow, it's Lindsay Woolsey, but it's striped, but it's plain weave. And, and then it was a bit of a puzzle until we looked really closely at them and realized that the warp is single dented, set close together, or kind of at a regular set, and then double dented. So it's crammed together and then opened up and crammed together and opened up. And just that placement of the, of the warp in the reed creates this visually striped pattern. And these two pieces, I believe, were woven as grige goods, which is the term used to refer to uh, cloth that is woven in, an, in its natural color. So in this case, cotton and wool, and then sections of it dyed to order or dyed in different colors to be able to offer your customers um, different options. And the, this crimson piece has a kind of pale peachy um, weft, which is as much of this crimson dye, uh, possibly cochineal, as the weft could take up. And you see up closer, you can see these kind of thicker and thinner areas. And this burgundy piece has a gray, the, the cotton that was used as the warp for this piece took up this dark red dye as more of a gray in the cotton. And um, so I believe they were originally woven just as uh, un, undyed natural colored cotton and undyed wool. Here you can see the striping a lot better. So just interesting pieces. Now, this 
is a fascinating piece. Um, I went to teach at the Midwest Weavers Conference uh, maybe six years ago, and one of the programs that they had um, kind of building up to the workshop portion of the conference was a program about a Lindsay Woolsey quilt. And I thought, but Lindsay Woolsey is a fabric. What? <laughs> I, think I had never heard of a quilt made out of Lindsay Woolsey fabric. Well, there are not many that have survived, but we got to see two at this program. And um, there's a, a quilting publication that has written an article about them, but I'm, I have not heard of more than six or eight of them. And there may well be more out there, but people don't recognize the the quality of them and not all of this is Lindsay Woolsey because of the the little plaid pieces would not be a cotton or a linen warp and a wool weft because you've got that plaid patterning but most of the fabric in here well it's all hand spun and hand woven and hand dyed veg vegetable dyed and it's just a remarkable piece of pioneer history so this piece was collected in Indiana and um, and oh, one of the presenters at this program had found one also at an antiques barn covering a piano. So there were two in the room and the local guild here decided to take this on as a project. They analyzed the quilt. They made it created a map of all of the fabrics used and where they were used and which which blocks were pieced and they identified the dyes used to create these colors. They bought a fleece or possibly more than one and they spun yarn and wove that yarn and dyed and dyed their colors as needed and they made a reproduction of this quilt. So we're looking at the original quilt and it has all these different fabrics in it the the quilting itself was done with some kind of a bowl as a marker it's just a series of circles somewhat random randomly stitched and they made a map of that as well but all of this hand woven it's like it's like a history of the cloth that was woven in that family or in that little village all put together in this one one old quilt And here is the notebook that they put together and part of their um, their documentation of this. And I think a lot of this was woven at Connor Prairie Village on the old looms there. This certainly looks like one of those old um, barn frame type looms. And they identified different samples. Um, this is a piece of reproduction fabric that stapled to the sample just so that they would have a record of this book and then the list of the numbered blocks in which this fabric appeared. And excuse me, this is the reproduction quilt that they made. It's just an extraordinary piece of work. There was one woman in the guild who started this project and then she couldn't work on it anymore, passed away, and someone picked it up again, maybe five or six years later, and managed to see it through to its conclusion. It's just an extraordinary thing. So it's beautiful. They have this amazing thing that they made, and you can pick it up and look at it and touch it and, you know, learn learn about it. So this was the second Lindsay Wilsey quilt that was found um, with just this plain blanket backing on it. And, and we got to see that one as well. And this one is just tied. It doesn't have any stitched quilting on it. And these are the fabrics that we're looking at. So you might say this isn't all Lindsay Woolsey fabric, but that's how they're describing the, the fabric. But it is certainly hand spun, hand woven, hand dyed, vegetable dyed. Amazing, amazing. Just astonishing amount of work. Okay, we're gonna look at some linens and towels. And then a little bit of clothing to wrap up. So this is a linen square from, uh, this is a reproduction created by Bill Leinbach. Um, these were folded in half and worn as kerchiefs by women. Here are some of the other uh, variations of that that Bill has from his studio. These are some of the checked pieces of linen that he has. And I just love this stuff. I, checks and plaids, simple plaids make me very happy. 
as a weaver and a looker. This is a very German piece with these little framed blocks. And I love the brown and blue together. And they're really simple, more simple checks. This is a pillow slip. This is from Roddy Moore's collection. Um, pillows were more bolster sized. I think these are both linen. Um, and so you would make a slip that you could put over the pillow and take off to wash just as we do today. Um, but this lovely small figured linen check. And here's a here's another one. Here's the other one. So there were two with these little tiny linen checks. And a third one, this is a very German style, more kind of rectilinear, I guess is how I think of some of the German patterning. And this is some M's and O's. Some more M's and O's, these beautiful O's. More. <laughs> this is a, a, a typical linen weave used throughout North America in the 1700s and 1800s. And we still find it today occasionally. I'll pick up a scarf somewhere because I think it has an interesting texture and look at it and realize that it's, it's good old M's and O's. So you have sections where there's a little bit of an overshot that creates these columns. In this case, there's four columns. And then it alternates with a plain weave area. And when this, is, this cloth is washed, the plain weave area is able to expand into those overshot areas above and around it. And it takes on a more um, of an O shape, a round shape. So you're getting quite close. You can see there are threads going over multiple threads to create those little columns and then these plain weave areas that expand out. And this is another M's and O's with a different setup to alternate in a different pattern. This is a very fancy, this is at least a 10 or 12 harness um, weave, a small figured linen weave. Here's a, just a simple, hand spun hand woven handkerchief and i love the use of thick and thin threads and it's interesting how this type of patterning endured into the age of machine spun handkerchiefs my father had handkerchiefs that would have either had colored stripes or plain stripes much like this in the border areas now we're going to look at a little bit of clothing these are some chemises from the line box collection these would have been hand spun, hand woven linen. They would have been hand stitched. Uh, women wore chemises um, as their under layer. They would sleep in them. And then when they rose in the morning, they would uh, put on their other clothes on top of them. Look at the tiny stitching of these initials. This one has um, gathering at the sleeves, the gusset under the other underarm means that you can use less fabric and have a fairly close fitting garment, but still have ease of movement, plenty of um, room to move your arms. And here is uh, a name and date uh, written in ink, but with a very, very fine pen. And this one has a square yoke piece that's gathered to the yoke. And this is a, a man's shirt. Um, men's shirts didn't change very much over <laughs> several centuries. And there are many, many beautiful examples of these um, gathered linen, gathered into the collar with a kind of a saddle shoulder and very simple. This is a, a, a man's shirt from um, the Pleasant Hill Shaker Museum in Kentucky. Men also slept in their shirts and donned the rest of their clothes on top of them. So um, some, some men's shirts were quite long, almost knee length. We can get in a little closer and see some of the details, some tucking, the initials, those lovely tiny cross-stitched initials. And here we have a dress. This is also in the collection of the Shaker Museum at Pleasant Hill. And um, I think that it is linen, but I would have to look under a microscope. What I find extraordinary about this dress is that someone loved it so much that they practically rebuilt the bodice um, as it wore out. And it has endured. It's hung 
in a place where it got some sun damage. You see the lighter areas in those vertical folds of the skirt. Um, the dyeing has faded so that it's more inconsistent this is one of the things that researchers love to find because it identifies very quickly that we had a blue warp and a red weft. Um, so definitely indigo dyed warp and either a cochineal or I think in this case, probably a matter weft, that red color, but that's the matter has faded and, and the indigo as well where the sun met it. But look at these crazy buttons, all this patching patching all the way up the underarm, parts of the sleeves. Uh, it's fully lined and has had probably more than one generation of um, shields in the arm armpit area. Half the sleeve has been rebuilt. I looked at this dress and I thought somebody loved this dress. <laughs> I also wondered if someone had inherited it and then tried to keep it alive. It has so many details, pockets, what would a woman's dress be without pockets? Pretty good sized pockets too, like 10 inch pockets. Okay, that's it. We've come to the end. And I, I never know exactly how long this is going to take. So actually I didn't go over my hour and we can um, have some questions if anybody yeah, has Thank any you questions. so much for that presentation, Melissa. It's just some truly pretty amazing examples, collections you took some pictures of. Um, so far we have one question. Um, how do you know if a blanket is southern? Is it the colors, the weight, or just where the location, where it was found? Well, most textiles don't come with a lot of information. Um, people move around. Um, for In terms of blankets, I'm not really uh, versed on how you might determine where a blanket came from unless it has a specifically, a, a specific detail. With coverlets, there's a large book called On Coverlets, which is all Southern coverlets, overshot coverlets. And my experience with reading that book and with the coverlets I've seen traveling in the South, a lot of Southern coverlets have are more blocky, have more squared patterns in them. And a lot of the New England coverlets have more of a round, but it's not consistent. Um, and most of the southern coverlets have three panels, so two seams. Most of the northern coverlets have a single seam. But again, a weaver might choose to do something a little different if for any kind of reason at all. So it, it, is, it is pretty tricky. Unless you have a family that donates a piece and says, this has been in our family. We know the great, great grandmother who wove it. You know, if you have that kind of information, then um, that helps you say, oh, well, look at this piece. We know this is from, say, Winchester, Virginia, and it's a three-color overshot with these big wheels. Oh, okay, well, we can we can add that to our list of information. All right. Um, just one more call. If, any, if you have any questions for Melissa while she's still here, um, feel free to use the chat feature at the bottom. And just a quick note, we've recorded this program and we have a couple of other, of Melissa's other presentations available on the LCPL online programs uh, YouTube channel. So definitely check that out with a, bunch, with a bunch of other programs as well that you might be interested in. Let's see, um, just a couple comments saying, I um, really appreciate you, Melissa, for sharing your knowledge in these photos. A lot of people are sending their comments how much they enjoyed seeing the pictures and hearing you talk about them. So definitely well, thank you for being here tonight. Oh, well, thank you for giving me the opportunity. I, as you can probably tell, I really enjoy um, sharing my passion for all these old textiles. It's a, a fascinating road to go down and explore and learn about.